Okay, today's lesson is 10-4 in our book, which is ellipses, and I'm going to start it a little bit differently because I think this is a little cool demonstration that my teacher did with me, and I really liked it. Shout out to Ellen Breck. Suppose you have a piece of string 10 units long. So this is my string here that's 10 units, and you tack down the ends of its string like this. And if you take a pencil such that you can kind of, the, the string is taut, and you drag it around, what kind of shape will you have? You try to draw a smooth curve? Well, here is an example of what you will have. Um, this piece of string happens to be 16 units long, so this distance and this distance will add up to 16. And you'll see as I drag my point P around, notice that the, sum, that the length of my string is 16. So the length of my string is the distance from P to F1 plus the distance from P to F2. And you see these numbers changing as I drag it around, but of course their sum never changes. Well, that's kind of cool. I think a nice little demonstration. And that is what our geometric definition of an ellipse is. An ellipse is a set of all points P in a plane such that the sum Remember the sum is when we add, answer to an addition problem. The sum of the distances from two fixed points, F1 and F2, that doesn't say F, F2, is a constant. And in our book, they use the letter K to denote that constant. A focus of an ellipse is one of those two fixed points. Plural, we say foci. So if you look at my picture over here, which is similar to what I already talked about, this is a focus, but you can call it F1 if you want to. Here is F2, another focus. So I have my two fixed points, and each of these you saw when I just did it before, if you drag it around, then you will get this elliptical shape. But this is the set of all points, and all the points that will satisfy that will be on this curve. So. Mathematically, the sum of those distances is PF1 plus PF2 is equal to K. That just says the distance between those two points. And K will always be larger than the distance from F1 to F2. Okay? So let's look at that. Excuse me. Some other characteristics that we need to know about the ellipse. Okay? We have two axes always. We will have a major axis, and that's the segment that contains the focus. Actually, I should say foci because we have more than one. And its endpoints on the ellipse. Its midpoint is always the center of the ellipse. The minor axis is perpendicular to the major axis at the center, so they will always intersect at the center of your ellipse. Major will always be longer than minor. You have the vertices of an ellipse. This is the plural form of vertex. And they are the endpoints of your major axis. And the covertices of an ellipse are the endpoints of the minor axis. So that's basically defining all those terms. Let's go put them on the picture just to help it get in your brain. So this first part is pointing to the center. This is pointing to the longer of your two axes, so this is the major axis. This is pointing to an endpoint of the major axis, so that's called the vertex. This bubble is pointing to the sh shorter axis, so it is the minor axis. And the endpoint of your minor axis is called a co-vertex. Okay, this is a horizontal ellipse because my major axis is horizontal. Over here, we go to a vertical ellipse and my major axis, which is right here, is, and that doesn't spell major, the major axis is vertical. So this is my major axis. The end point of my major axis is the vertex. Right here is pointing to the center where the major and the minor axis always intersect. 
and then we have the shorter axis is your minor axis and the endpoint of the minor axis is called a covertex. So you have a picture of the words that you need to know, vocab defined in paragraph form, and now let's go talk about the equations that go along with it. So first off, for a horizontal ellipse, we will have x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals 1. And for vertical, it will be x squared over b squared plus y squared over a squared equals 1. So, if you notice, what changed was the a and the b. a is under the x, that is when we have a horizontal, your major axis will be horizontal. If a is under the y, then your major axis will be vertical. The main thing that you want to get out of that is that a is always larger than b because remember we talked about the major axis will always be longer than the minor axis. And so that also, I'm going to go back here because I'm going to draw some more on our little pictures here. Our vertices will be plus or minus a zero or zero plus or minus a. But my major axis, okay, so this is my major axis. Uh, I kind of missed that. Let me try that one more time. From the center to the vertex, that's the distance of a. Okay, then my covertices, 0 plus or minus b, or plus or minus b, 0, that's going to be the endpoints of my minor axis. So this has a length of b. And then, just like we had in a parabola, foci denoted with the letter c will be plus or minus c, 0. They will always be on the same one with the vertices, or 0 plus or minus c. And so from my picture, that is this right here. That is the distance from the center to a focus, which is similar to what we talked about with our parabola. Okay? Um, and now, the last thing we need to do before we talk about some problems, if I can go up just a little bit, the length of the major axis. So if I go from the center to one part of the major axis is A, and the center to the other vertex is A, then that should be easy for you to realize that A plus A or 2a is the length of my major axis. And in a similar fashion, b goes to the minor axis is the endpoint, so b plus b lets me know that the, the length of my minor axis will be 2b. Now, the other thing on this last picture, what's important that you've got to know to be able to work these problems is the relationship between a, b, and c. So I gave you this picture to help you see, and I don't know if you remember when we did the little ellipse, and our string was 16, that this was 8 and 8. But if you can see that, this distance is A, because they were equal, and so that was 2A that we've talked about. Anyway, this is A, this is B, from the minor axis to the center, and the center to the focus is C. So that gives us, from a Pythagorean relationship, that C squared is equal to a squared minus b squared. That is, a is always larger than b, so you remember you're just subtracting the smaller number from the bigger number, but you gotta remember that relationship because you're not gonna be able to tell what c is by looking at the equation as we did in a parabola. Okay, so let's look at the first problem. What's the equation in standard form of an ellipse centered at the origin with a vertex of 0, 5 and a covertex of 2, 0? Well, if they tell me the center is at the origin, I'm going to go write my equation. x squared over something plus y squared over something equals 1. And you can go plot it. I kind of want to point this out to you, okay, because it, sometimes people get confused with the a and b, and you don't have to get bogged down with the a and the b. Yes, it's a vertex, but if I go 0 to 5, and this is 5 units, then I know that this is my movement of up and down, and so this number squared is going to go under the y, and 5 squared is 25. And then I have another vertex at 2, 0. That is my y movement, so that number squared is going to be under the x. So this is the equation. Now, if you want to relate it to your a, b, and c, 
this is A, Bovertex is B, but sometimes people have trouble going, well, where do I put it under which one? If you plot it, whichever way you plotted that is going to go under that variable. Okay? So, moving right along, and remember again, this is that's A and that's B, but this is B squared, and this is A squared, because A is always larger, and you square it when you put it into your equation. Okay, look at number two. What are the coordinates of the foci of the ellipse with the equation 36 square, 36x squared plus 100y squared equals 3600? And then graph the ellipse. So before when we had this equation in section one, we just covered it up and found the intercepts. But from our standard equation, if you notice, it was always equal to one. And we make it equal to one by dividing by whatever number we have here. So I'm gonna divide every term by 3600 and 36 goes into 3600 100 times. Similarly, 100 goes into 3600 36 times. So you're just reducing this fraction equal to 1. So this is my equation that I'm going to graph. My center is at 0, 0, and they always will be in this section until we learn about moving them. So my center is at 0, 0. And as I said, I'm not worried about A or B. I know in the x direction I'm going to go the square root of that number because this is a squared number. So left and right, I'm going to go 10. And under the y, up and down, I'm going to go 6 because I'm taking the square root of that number. So you have to take the square root to graph it. Um, all right, and now do your best to make an elliptical shape. Try not to give any any sharp corners. And let's see. Oh, poo. That was not what was supposed to happen. Let's try that again. Ellipse. That color. And we'll try that one more time. There we go. There's my ellipse. Okay. So they also ask us to find the foci. And actually, they asked us to find the foci first and then graph it. But if you've been watching the other videos, you know I'm more about the picture and finding that picture. And now I know that my foci are going to be somewhere on that major axis because they're always on the longer axis. But we have to know that equation that we talked about and the relationship that we have between A and B. A is always the larger number, so this is A squared and this is B squared. And I know that C squared equals A squared minus B squared. So C squared equals 100 minus 36. C squared equals 64. And C equals plus or minus 8, because I take the square root of both sides. And so since they're on this axis, then that's the X coordinate. And I'm going to name the X coordinate, which is plus or minus 8, 0. So my foci are plus or minus 8, 0. Okay, moving on, great application of an ellipse. A room with an elliptical ceiling, called an ellipsoid since it's three-dimensional, forms a whispering gallery. Thanks to the reflective property of an ellipse, a whispered message at one focus can be heard clearly by someone standing across the room at the other focus. So you're standing over here talking to your colleagues, often in the world of politics, and they think that, you can't, that these people can't hear you because you're way across the room when actually they can. And this is real, they're real life buildings, y'all. So I hope you have the opportunity to go try it out. Or as Allie told me today, in the ice rink, she got the same situation happens. So if the elliptical ceiling has a major axis of 120 feet and a minor axis of 72 feet, how far apart are the foci? So we're looking for this, for the foci, that's C. But they told us that the major axis was 120 feet. So 120 feet, 120, is the length of my major axis. And we talked about that. That length is 2A. That was at the bottom of our notes page that we just talked about. So that tells me that A is equal to 60. And minor axis is 72 feet. So 72 is equal to 2B and therefore B equals 36. And if I need to find C, then I'm going to use my relationship. C squared equals A squared minus B squared. So C squared equals 
60 squared, which is 3,600, minus 36 squared, which is 1,296. So C squared equals 2,304. You take the square root of both sides, and then C equals plus or minus 48. So how far apart are the foci? I hope you didn't say 48. Because remember, the foci, C is the distance from the foci to the center. So this is 48, and this is 48, which means how far apart are the foci, because you have to add them together or double them. And so the answer to a problem is they're 96 feet apart. So that's a pretty big room. Okay, last problem. What is the standard form of an equation of an ellipse with foci at 0 plus or minus the square root of 17, covertices at plus or minus 6, 0. All right, so foci is still the letter C, so this tells me that C equals the square root of 17. And this tells me covertices is B, so B is equal to 6. Now, um, if you want to graph it, let's graph it, because if your center is not at 0, 0, it's a little harder. So I have the square root of 17 and I have negative square root of 17, and I know that my center has to be halfway between those. So that does make my center at 0, 0, and therefore I'm going to have x squared over something plus y squared over something equals 1, and that's going to be my equation. Now I have to figure out what to put under. I'm not worried about which one's x or b. I got b right here, but I don't know which one's a and which one's b. But if I plot it, and I plot 6, and I plot negative 6, that's in my x direction. So I know this has to go under the x. And of course we put 6 squared, because it's always b squared, so that's going to be 36. And now I have to go find a. And we have our equation. c is 17, and b is 6. So I have c squared equals a squared minus b squared. The square root of 17 squared is 17. a squared, we don't know, but b squared is 36, because b was 6. I squared it here. So how do I get that to the other side? I have to add 36. 17 plus 36 is a squared, and that's the number that goes under the y. So it is 53, and we are done with our problem. We didn't have to plot it, but that, you know, 53 is going to be up here, but the square root of 53 will be larger than 6. And you know that A, because A always has to be the largest number. So let me know if you have any questions. Email me or come see me, and we will talk again soon.